Yeah. All right, well, maybe that'll give me time to introduce the topic. Um, I kind of came upon this because I feel like I've heard a lot of people talk about chi as like a belief, something you have to believe in, um, in the general public. And I'm like, wait a minute. I think anyone here, like, we don't really think of it as a belief system. We experience it sort of viscerally, but it's hard to explain. It's, we don't have a great um, word to translate chi into, and I think it, it's difficult for us interacting with other health professions, interacting with legislatures when we want, you know, scope of practice change. Like, how do we explain to them, what are we basing our medicine on, you know, this character ends up being an issue sometimes, I think. So, I hope you're ready to go on a journey with me, because this is going to be a little bit of a whirlwind. <laughs> so, I figure I bring up the idea of epistemology, basically how do we know anything. Um, that's sort of at the core of the topic. Um, it's like, how do you, you know, come to the idea of knowledge? How do you justify your beliefs? I think something that a lot of times isn't talked about is like what role do beliefs play in the search for knowledge and I think that's regardless of how you're searching for knowledge that's a big aspect people call it a priori um, and it's it's an issue that plagues science as well as you know sort of looking back at ancient texts um, and then this idea of phenomenology um, it's basically how we experience phenomena in the world and in some ways, you can argue that basically everything is phenomenological, and no matter how many machines we use to mediate our experience, it's still through our experience that we come to know the world. Um, and in that sense, there's this question about what is objectivity and how objective can we actually be um, as all being having our own subjective experience. So I figured I'd start off with Chi as breath or your breath of life. Um, this is sort of a common term throughout a lot of languages. And um, in English, we have sort of respiration, inspiration, and expiration, but we also have spirit, which all of which relate to Latin spiritus, which really just comes from breath. And Greek, pneuma, Sanskrit, prana, Hebrew, ruach, and uh, Arabic, ruch. But all of these kind of and I think if we think about just our direct experience of life, it's like, is someone breathing or not? Is pretty clear, like, are they alive? So I think this is, it's in some ways obvious, but it, I think, has to be stated because chi, in sort of the more materialist lens, is often thought of simply as breath. But we can say, like, well, of course, in our own language, we have this wisdom also that breath is something more than just air. So this idea of vital energy, this one is problematic because a lot of people in the materials world worldview don't see vital energy as a real thing. But I would say what they do see as a real thing is ATP. And if we look at what, how do we get energy into our body, we have photosynthesis bringing sunlight together with carbon dioxide and water, producing glucose and oxygen. And basically the glucose and oxygen come back together to produce carbon dioxide and water in our mitochondria fusing um, or phosphorylating adenosine diphosphate into adenosine triphosphate, storing that sunlight in those bonds. And so ATP then is this carrier of sunlight in the body. It's basically nearly universal um, in terms of biochemistry as a currency for energy. And it's literally carrying sunlight through our body. And I thought it's interesting when we really look at the character Qi, we see the radical for rice and the radical for air. Well, we can think of rice as a source of glucose, air as a source of oxygen. They come together in our body literally to form ATP. So I don't think that this isn't, you know, I think that we can speak to sci scientists on their own terms. Like, you know, this is what ancient people were describing. I don't think it was something terribly nebulous. But maybe this isn't a full definition either. So what I posit is a better definition is information. And the reason is, is because chi often denotes a quality, function, or nature of a substance rather than a quantity of energy. Um, and this makes sense even in, in physics. Information theory posits that all forms of energy can be understood as information. Um, 
and because energy informs space, it it gives it in, it literally transmits as information. Um, and so in this way, we can take things like the flavor, temperature, and function of an herb, which are not really caloric values, you know, they're not pr giving us any more glucose or ATP, but they're being produced by what in botany is called secondary metabolites, things that are not primary to our metabolism. And um, instead, caloric energy is actually consumed to produce these complex molecules that actually can have a bigger effect than the calories would have. And it's a bigger effect because of increased complexity. And so you see something like this, aconitine from aconite or FUDSA, as we heard about in Chelsea's case. Um, this is an incredibly complex molecule, much more complex than glucose. And it has an incredibly strong effect it, in higher doses, it can kill people. But in lower doses, we use it as an extremely beneficial herb. So I thought I'd bring the Tao Te Ching into it a little bit. Um, these are lines that are some of the most famous lines, chapter one and chapter 42. Um, a way that can be followed is not a constant way. And this to me, it references an idea that started to come to light um, in studying this topic, um, which is that things constantly evolve. And in the sciences and studying like information theory and how it's being applied now, the understanding of, of permutation of information and energy is, is becoming one of the more um, focused on subjects because people are trying to understand like when we tr try to transmit information, in what ways does it actually move through the world over time. Um, and this has become the study of permutation entropy. Um, wherein basically as entropy tries to move things toward equilibrium it causes them to permutate into smaller versions of themselves through fractal geometry um, and so then I this other line that's very commonly um, quoted the way produces the one the one produces the two the two produce the three and the three produce the myriad creatures which is more literally 10,000 things or everything um, this kind of describes permutation and this is how permutation works. Things differentiate, and then they further differentiate, and then their interactions cause them to continue to produce more in increasing complexity over time. Um, I also thought this next sentence was interesting to bring in. The myriad of creatures shoulder or carry yin and embrace or enfold yang, and by blending or infusing these qi, they attain <coughs> harmony. And I think this is important because this describes something going counter to equilibrium forces, something that's holding yang that wants to basically go toward equilibrium and spread out, it's holding it inside of yin in order that it can't. Um, and so this is sort of how information becomes refined and deepened is by being pulled inward rather than being allowed to just spread out toward equilibrium. So, I've, so the origin of yin and yang is in the I Ching, and I'm just gonna barely touch on the I Ching. <laughs> because that's a much deeper topic. But I thought I'd point out some interesting things um, that correlate between I Ching and modern science is, um, we can see here, this is sort of the original pattern of what's known as the Fushi or earlier heaven trigram sequence. Um, it starts here and comes down through here, crosses and comes back around. Each of the trigrams that oppose each other are inversions of one another. And if we follow this pattern, looking at the solid lines as ones and the broken lines as zeros, we actually get a binary sequence that when translated into our normal decimal system, reads as 76543210, which I thought was really interesting because this means that Fushi or whomever put this together was actually understanding you know, in what we now call binary code um, as a way of encoding information um, and you know binary code is so fundamental that it's able to process really any information can be encoded into binary um, including our, our study of genetics has exploded because it's been converted into binary code through computational genetics um, and what's interesting to point out about DNA as well um, a codon of DNA which codes for um, an amino acid in a protein is three nucleotides and since there's four nucleotides in three spots you get a possibility of 64 codons 
which is the same number of hexagrams in the I Ching because they have six lines each, each one having um, the possibility of two possibilities, you get also 64. So you can see why binary is so fundamental and important to understanding information in space and time at all. And so the fact that this is where sort of Chinese philosophy originates and we've sort of just made it there in the recent sort of maybe century in terms of computations in our technological world. Um, and so these are two depictions of the ways in which we can understand the hexagrams of the I Ching. This one shows a grid based on the eight trigrams combining. Um, and this one shows if we were to follow it from basic yin and yang and adding one, um, one more line for each um, section. This is more of like a permutative map. So my idea is that the nature of the Tao is this kind of evolving nature. It's this increasing in complexity over time. And so um, these kinds of understanding began with this idea of chaos theory. Chaos theory was basically exploring fractal decay of information. Um, they were exploring it through weather systems, radio wave decay, uh, and eventually, <coughs> as the tie-in with um, entropy was better understood, it, the study has been changed to permutation entropy. Um, and it's this idea that equilibrium is, we move toward equilibrium by um, iterating these scalar um, versions of the thing from which it originated. So you get this kind of fractal microsystem producing nature of um, energy. But then there's causal entropy, and this is only, this is still a little bit more controversial. It was partially discovered through um, an algorithm that was used to spontaneously generate adaptive behavior. Um, and what it was is this idea that we can maximize potential entropy. And one way to think about it is, is like entropy is taking stored energy and expressing it into the world. And so to maximize the potential to do that is to sort of store energy, right? This, this idea we enfold yang. Um, and the more yang that's enfolded, the more potential. There's other things that lead to it because there's also this need for future degrees of freedom. So, um, you know, the less sort of dependent or um, hemmed in that, that something is, the also the more access to these degrees of freedom it has to enact the entropy. Um, and this has led to the emergence of seemingly in intelligent behavior spontaneously. And this made me think a lot about Nietzsche. He says life is a will to power. And if we really think about power in the sense of physics, like literally power as the expression of potential energy, then, um, then he's saying the same thing, that if we want to, you know, it, that life naturally actually accumulates energy in order that it can express that energy as power over time through this idea of entropy. So that life is naturally actually in this way intelligent. It's spontaneously intelligent. Um, and fractal geometries are really interesting because our, our biology is based on fractal geometries, not on linear geometries. And this actually is what allows our bodies to be extremely efficient beyond the limits of our technology. Um, and I, I coined this term microcosmic density. Like basically as things sort of move toward these smaller and smaller iterations, they, they cause increasing complexity, um, but they produce this self-same sort of image of the thing from which they came. And so there, this idea of microcosms that we find all over the body that re-represent the whole body in Chinese medicine is a natural outcome of the way in which qi moves or information moves through the body. And so I had to show this, uh, an image of neurons and uh, a gif of uh, fractal geometry that I thought mirror each other in quite interesting ways, especially because there's studies showing that fMRI studies of the brain that increased, um, increased entropy in the brain actually correlates with increased intelligence and adaptive behavior. So these are coming together scientifically quite nicely. And so I figured I'd mention like what are quantum phenomena in biology, since that's part of my title. Um, 
So quantum phenomena refers to this idea of coherence, entanglement, and superposition. These things all sort of have similarities and, and work together. Um, entanglement, people think of as like two particles become entangled, and the, the reality is, is really what happens more in biology is coherence, where a large, num a large amount of our system is actually all entangled together and acting cohesively. And this is why like, we can have the same genome throughout our body and yet it acts, you know, it acts as it needs to in each location. It's because it's cohering. There's this com instant communication on a quantum level, um, and I'll get into why exactly. But it, but these quantum phenomena sort of actually they don't quite reverse entropy, but they are what allow us to reach levels of efficiency that we can actually not be entirely beholden to entropy at all times and be falling apart, basically. Um, so one of these things that's been studied is biophotons. It's coherent light that moves through the microtubules of cellular architecture and is quantum entangled with DNA. So this could be thought of, I think, as the consciousness in every cell. Um, the primovascular system, formerly Bongen ducts, um, is a vascular system that actually mirrors the acupuncture channels and points, but it's extremely fine, and what they all they've found in it is basically genetic material, and so there's this idea that maybe these channels are actually used for biophoton intercommunication um, extracellularly. Um, and then ORC or orchestrated objective reduction, they're looking into the nature of basically our microtubules and how on a chemical level the subunits of tubulin can actually produce these coherent superpositions that allow for our um, cellular architecture to act as a quantum computing system that allows consciousness to make choices in the world rather than simply be the product of cause and effect. Um, and also the e efficiency of photosynthesis now is being understood as a quantum effect um, where the photon as it comes into the chloroplast is actually goes into superposition throughout the chloroplast and then snaps into position where its most efficient path to being absorbed would have been. Um, this also happens with the electron movement, and then basically there's a near 100% uh, conversion of sunlight into chemical energy that we're not even close to with solar panels, like 25%. And so then I thought I'd end with, here's a sort of proposition as, you know, I think of the three tre treasures as sort of like each, so the whole group of them is often talked about as chi, and so to me it's like if we really want to understand chi, we have to understand all three. Um, and so from these different categories of understanding, um, I think that we can see there's ways in which to use them, and I think information is one that's more universal but maybe more awkward um, in, in normal conversation where like Jing is actually the structural bits that are encoded, and Qi is the language or, or the meaning of the code itself, um, and then Shun being the transmission of that code. Um, but you know, from an energy perspective, it's like potential energy, kinetic energy, and radiant energy, like light. And we you know, see Shun Ming often used. Um, in bio biology, we can say that Jing represents sort of a gem genetic impulse, and this would be pre-heaven Jing. Uh, post heaven Jing is sort of our stored energy, but I get into that in my paper more. And then Qi sort of represents our metabolic energy, the force that allows us to move and be active. Um, and then Shen sort of our coherence of our consciousness and how it all comes together to actually produce something that is not just a, an android, a, a machine that pretends to be conscious, but actually something divine. So I thought I'd leave you with some nice practice. <laughs> 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 Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>